everybody. Welcome to Houdini Hangout. It's the 28th of June. Um, my name is Peter, and we'll be uh, talking about vellum fluids tonight, um, which should be pretty interesting. Um, if you haven't used it before, I think uh, might be something that, um, you know, will interest you, will be something maybe that you can add uh, to your, you know, repertoire of... Uh, you know, different techniques and tools uh, within the uh, vellum, you know, kind of uh, tool set as a, as a whole. And uh, yeah, I think it should be pretty interesting. Um, but first, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for tuning in again tonight after, um, after a few weeks away. I was over in Europe uh, talking to some folks, well, Two different things. I actually went to Ant the Annecy Festival in France, which was awesome and really enjoyable, and uh, got to meet some really cool people there. Uh, got to actually meet Chris Rutledge um, in person, which was really cool. Um, he was on my stream on the stream a couple uh, like a couple months ago, maybe, um, and uh, that was just really fun. We had a great time and got to kind of hang out and do you know just kind of screw around while, um, you know, after hours in the conference. And that was really cool. And, uh, um, you know, also got to meet a lot of really great people from the uh, education world, um, different people from studios and, uh, you know, just get to kind of talk Houdini and connect with people from all over the place. So that was really great. Beautiful area. If you ever get the chance to go to the Annecy Festival, I highly recommend it, uh, not only for its um, really interesting um, kind of mix of um, different types of animation, I guess, but uh, and like screenings of like like early screenings and stuff. I think they showed an early screening of I don't even think it's the finished cut of the new Turtles movie that's coming out. Just a few things like that that were really interesting. So it uh, seems like a pretty cool place to get to see some um you know, some screenings and things like that and get to listen to talks and all sorts of different things. But uh, so that was pretty neat. Uh, and then I headed over to London for a workshop um, that was all about Solaris and USD in, in particular. And that was really great. Got to, again, meet a lot of really interesting people. Um, I think there was about 30 people uh, roughly in in the workshop that I, um, that I was running. And uh, also, I got to meet um, uh, Moeen and Mujtaba uh, Saeed, uh, the guys from Nine Between, and uh, those guys are awesome, and we had a ton of fun. Um, we were kind of going around London and, and just hanging out after the, the workshops each night, um, and then there was a uh, kind of a, a little behind-the-scenes forum thing the next day, which was pretty cool. Um, talking a little bit about the future of Houdini for studios in the London area. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just really exciting to get to meet them. I have a feeling uh, you'll be seeing them on on this stream uh, sometime in the not too distant future. Um, they're currently uh, actually making their their workshop into some courses that will go on to uh, the side effects website. So definitely check that out and I will be uh, promoting that. Um, you know, once it's out, their content is great. And I saw like little glimpses of what they were teaching and some of the stuff they were doing. And it was uh, really, really cool. So I think it'll be a neat thing to be able to kind of work through. So, hey, GMZ, uh, nice to have you on the stream. Welcome. Um, so, yeah, so I got to, uh, again, meet some really cool people. Also, um, for me, it was kind of special because I got to um, uh, meet uh, Simon Holmendahl, who was actually in my workshop. Um, and it was crazy because he's him and the other, you know, man versus machine and the Antagma guys and all, all that kind of group of, you know, motion graphics kind of commercial work. Um, those guys were, uh, really influential in getting me started into Houdini. So it was really cool to be able to kind of give back a little bit, teach him some stuff about USD, um, that I've been cramming into my brain for the last year or so now. And, uh, yeah, so it was a really cool time and, uh, was, you know, got to, got to do a lot of stuff. It was like 11 or 12 days away from home, which was a decent amount. Um, and I was really glad to be back, but, um, yeah, I've been it, gladly getting back into some Houdini now, like actually doing stuff versus teaching and, uh, things like that. But it's, uh, 
yeah, I've, the last couple of days have been great just to kind of get my mind back around this. Kind of pop open some vellum and screw around with that a little bit, get some get some uh, fluid stuff going. And uh, I have a couple things that I definitely want to show tonight. And depending on how long it takes uh, for us to get through them, uh, we might just kind of go off the cuff and screw around with some other things. Um, so again, we're talking fluids tonight. Um, we're going to be looking at, um, it, you know, just again, the basics of setting something like that up, what um, the, you know, the attributes that are going to live on those, the points are going to be, um, how it works, kind of, um, you know, some of the key concepts that that kind of feed into the Vellum solver in order to make, um, you know, in order to make the solver do what we uh, are expecting for it to do. Um, and uh, we'll play around with some different ways to um, kind of work with the fluids, um, maybe a little bit of a zero G thing just to kind of get a sense of how that might work. I think that's a little bit more, uh, you know, some of these more abstract kind of examples are what you would use vellum fluids for anyways. Um, it's not like we're going to be, um, you know, you're not trying to replace flip. Uh, flip is great for what it does. Um, but when you're talking about, you know, smaller scale blobs and things like that of fluid, um, you know, especially when it's starting to interact with other things uh, like cloth and, and uh, you know, other other types of vellum simulations, maybe hair or grains. Um, that's where really the power of vellum fluids comes in. Um, it's not going to be the high quality, you know, it's not going to be the highest quality possible fluid simulation. It's not meant to be. It's meant to be for smaller things like little splashes, product shots, things like that, um, that are going to be a little bit more... Um, you know, detail oriented, I guess, maybe with, um, you know, with where you want things to go, you can control it maybe a little bit easier. Um, and it's going to interact more easily with, um, the other things that you might have in your scene. Also for abstract things, I think it'll, it's a really good, um, tool to kind of use. So I'm not going to be doing really any, like, um, you know, trying to get everything to integrate all together into one SIM. Maybe that'll be something we'll do later. Um, you know, in a, Follow, like in a kind of follow-up last stream type thing, just kind of bringing everything together into one scene, um, you know, with with cloth and hair and grains and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but mainly we're going to be focusing on exactly what the fluid is doing in our scene because um, I think once you understand what the fluid's doing and we've talked about what some of the other um, tools are, you know, the other types of, of um, you know, configurations of vellum, I think you'll be able to kind of understand how these these will interact when you put them together into a uh, into a simulation all you know all in one so um, this is going to look kind of similar to how we emitted grains into our simulation uh, if you remember back to that um, and uh, I think it'll be pretty intuitive if you've been following along with the the process that we've been doing here um, but I think we'll we'll be able to do some cool stuff, uh, do some multi like fluids like going together, um, different viscosities and things like that that are able to all be in the same simulation together, um, and you can control and things like that. So um, I think it's it's neat because I think the control of this type of fluid is just a lot more um, straightforward since it's all points. It's not getting converted into volumes like flip is, and there's not some of these other steps that might be a little less. Um, simple to understand. In this case, we're basically just working on points the whole time. Um, and anything pops, you can do with pops. Um, oh, thanks so much. Sorry, it's uh, it's a little late over there. Um, yeah, I'm I'm definitely uh, trying to think about ways to uh, you know in a, uh, have have better uh, you know times for streams uh, for folks over in in uh, Europe and things like that. So. Uh, I'll be trying to think about how that's going to go forward. And maybe in the, in the following couple of weeks, I might implement a new uh, kind of schedule and things like that. So keep an eye out for it. But thank you for, for joining when you could. Sorry, it's so late. <laughs> um, so anyways, um, I guess that's enough of me talking. Um, if you guys have any questions or thoughts um, during, you know, any stream, any time that you're watching this, whether I say it or not, please uh, drop your comments or ideas into the chat. Um, if you think I'm doing something stupid, just let me let me know. Um, I don't know everything about Houdini, so um, always would 
you know, always very interested to hear from you guys. And, uh, if you have any questions or want to see something, um, uh, you know, just any, any, uh, you know, questions or thoughts that you might have as we go forward. Um, certainly happy to, uh, to comment on those and kind of, uh, go forward. I'm just seeing, uh, Carlos put something in the chat here. Um, so Carlos is just asking me a very general Houdini question, which I'll, which I will touch on real quick. So he's asking, uh, if I think that Houdini will be able to con compete against open source DCCs, real time and AI, uh, it seems like the rules of the game are changing. That's his comment. Um, so yeah, I think it's, I think it's a perfectly valid question to ask, right? I think, um, there certainly are a lot of, um, there's a lot of competition right now. Um, that's kind of out there. It's tough for me to think of the most, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to answer that where I'm not, you know, being overly critical of anything or, th or saying something that I maybe, you know, not trying to overstate anything, but, um, so first of all, one thing that you know, one thing that a lot of people talk about is like, so we'll open source DCCs, right? So Blender and things like that. I mean, Blender is awesome. It's gotten way, way better. Um, I know that there's been a lot of infusion of, of capital into the, the Blender foundation and things like that. Um, so yes, it's, it's open source and free, but it is also subsidized by other parts of the community. So there's a lot of financials that go into it, just not from the users. So that, that is certainly an interesting thing. Um, and uh, as long as I think, as long as that that capital is put into a thing like blender it'll continue to grow and and become better and better um i mean one thing you have to sort of realize is that um as far as products it, themselves houdini and blender are pretty different um and they have kind of different mentalities and different ways of working so um i think they're there's, it's good to have competition from Blender because that pushes us to be better. Um, and so we're always keeping an eye on that and, and, uh, kind of seeing what, you know, what's out there and, and how it works real time, you know, things like, um, you know, unreal and unity. Um, I think those are, those are, um, you know, certainly interesting things, but, um, I think just to take unreal for an example, you know, they're putting their procedural tools and things like that into, um, you know, into Unreal and into the engine, but um, they themselves have even said that if you want to do more advanced things, go to Houdini. You know, like that is that is kind of the the underlying idea here is that if you want to do a simple scatter, if you want to do a simple you know elemental setup, um, you can use their PCG setup you know process that they have in in um, in Unreal. However, if you want to do something that's gigantic world building stuff. Um, that's going to be um, as flexible as possible, that's where Houdini really comes in. And they certainly have some really flashy demos. Um, I haven't seen the exact ways of setting it up, but everything I've heard is kind of pointed to that where it's like, hey, you know, if you want to do certain things quickly and maybe more easily, you can do it right in, in engine and that's great. And otherwise, um, you know, there's things like, um, uh, you know, Houdini engine that works in Unreal and can, and can make, um, you know, connections really well into, into engine and PCG is actually, is I think going to be able to be leveraged by Houdini engine and actually create some better, um, connections and things like that and, and make Houdini engine even more efficient as well. Uh, the last thing is AI. And, and to be honest, I'm not a huge proponent of AI. Um, if AI takes my job, then I will be a guy in the woods working on, you know, screwing around with, you know, manually doing things the old fashioned way. Um, I don't see that happening industry wide top to bottom. I think there's some interesting stuff and there's certainly some cool things, but AI tends to be a little, I don't know. It feels a little vanilla and clean to me. Like it feels all the same. Um, it seems like a lot of things that come out of it are very similar. A lot of a lot of the artists that I've talked to out there in, in the industry more and more, um, uh, the, uh, you know, it feels like AI is, is, is generative, generative AI, 
um, is certainly something that a lot of people aren't really that interested in pursuing professionally. Um, now machine learning type stuff where you're help, where you're supporting tools that exist, creating faster ways of doing things by hand. I think that that's going to be a huge thing. I think that'll continue to be big and go further and further. Um, eliminating monotonous, repetitive tasks, huge rotoscoping. Let's, let's get rid of it. Like let's be done with it. Auto UVing stuff. Great. Let's get some machine learning and, and let's throw a million computers at that to try to figure that out. But like, you know, the things that people are annoyed by, let's tackle those things. I think those are the, the things that we should be looking at. Um, so, um, so yeah, there's, there's certainly some great, some great things out there. I see, uh, I'm going to say MA, MA, um, is saying in the chat as well about large pipeline stuff, um, that blender doesn't fit well into that. And certainly I've heard that as well. Um, you know, I think, I think there's always going to be things that certain new softwares and are going to have flashy new features. And, you know, that's going to be things that, that, as you know, working in Houdini, we're always going to be trying to um, go forward with. So I think there's lots of cool things on the horizon. It's not like we're just sitting here doing nothing. Um, the, the Houdini dev team is very active working on cool stuff. So um, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised by new things that are coming in Houdini. And uh, I think we're going to be keep our ear to the ground and make sure that we're listening kind of to the to the path that the industry's taking, um, and also not re overly reacting to new trends. So anyways, that's my two, my few cents of that. Um, but it's a great question. And it's something that I think it is worth asking yourself all the time is like, am I, t you know, learning skills that are going to treat, are going to put me in a position for success in the future? Like that's always a great question to ask. Um, cause really these are just tools, um, that you can hone your skills with. So, um, and you can be, you can choose what tools fit your style the best. So anyways, um, yeah, I always love that conversation. I think it's, I think sometimes we get a little doom and gloom if you feel like those things are coming for you, um, and are going to just keep knocking you out. Like, I don't think, I don't think the industry is going to inherently just switch, turn on a dime in, in a minute. Like there still is a lot of money at stake and a lot of studios are not just going to be like yeah let's just automate everything and not have anybody that knows how to actually fix stuff like i don't think that's going to happen anytime in the next year two i don't know but who knows maybe i'll be out of a job soon and i'll just be doing this in my basement but um you know i love houdini one way or another so i'll be screwing around with it for a very long time even if it's not being used so um that's my little soapbox i will get off of it we will continue talking about some vellum stuff but yeah i really appreciate the comments so let's actually dive into some houdini and start messing around so like i said uh kind of reset us a little bit here i we're going to be talking about fluids we're going to be talking about um, a few different setups but first of all we'll just make something that's basically the most simple setup that we can just some fluid kind of dropping into some sort of container and we'll go from there kind of look at how that works and um you know then we'll then we'll start um kind of setting up a few more um kind of different scenarios per se so yeah let's jump in um all right so let's make a geometry object here we'll call this um We'll just say simple vellum fluid. Jump inside, make a sphere, make this a bit smaller, maybe 0 0.5, something like that. And uh, let's let's move this up. I don't know. Sure. That looks great. Um Yeah, no problem, Carlos. Yeah, I mean, I, I, to be, you know, sorry, just to pause one more time. Um, I was literally sitting in the crowd uh, at GDC when they revealed the the new procedural stuff in Unreal, and I was a little bit like, oh gosh, like this is crazy. Like they're going for us, and I sat with it for a little bit, and then you know the rest of the thing happened. We left at the end, and I was talking to my manager, and I was kind of like, you know. 
I don't really know what it took to make that simulation, like that setup. Was it five minutes? Was it five hours? Was it five months? I don't really know. So I think from that standpoint, I... I try to take everything with a grain of salt. You know, these are marketing materials. They're made to look great. I mean, even Houdini and Houdini, we do that. We have these great marketing materials. And sometimes, sometimes you go to do it and you're like, oh, this isn't as easy as it looked in the, in the marketing materials. Uh, so that, that's always the case with marketing, right? You try to sh- put your best foot forward. So, um, so yeah, I mean, sometimes I try to take everything with a grain of salt. Some things are total game changers, you know, and that's, that's the, the way it is. And you have to kind of try to s- see those things for what they are. Um, so anyways, yeah, you're very welcome. I'm glad to kind of be able to give my two cents <laughs> for whatever it's worth. Um, you know, I'm certainly not a deep in the industry, but um, I know Houdini to some extent and what, where the things that we're trying to do. So anyways, so let's continue here. So I'm just going to up the frequency of this a little bit, maybe five. Yeah, for sure. MLOPS is awesome. Like they're doing some really cool stuff. Um, and uh, I think I think going forward, th- that'll just get better and better integrated. And you'll be able to kind of, I-, I think Houdini as a development platform is a huge part of what Houdini is, right? Houdini is made to be able to kind of plug things into it and develop on top of it. Um, if you saw um, Kai Stavinsky's um, feather talk from fmx he even said like this is a this is like this is a way to kind of standardize what people are doing with feathers and houdini this isn't something to say this is the only way you can do this this is kind of a starting point so that's even these tools right vellum vellum is expanded on by other you know by other studios and things like that they take it tweak it make it their own um you know, so that's kind of always what Houdini is. It's it's a way to it's a platform to kind of build on, right? We give tools and things like that, but even the tools we give are are built on the platform in, in a way. So there's there's always interesting things like that. But yeah, Robin's exactly right. Um, MLOPS is some really cool stuff, um, and uh, I know that there's going to be more and more coming from them, um, and that should be exciting for everybody that's interested in that kind of stuff. I think they'll they'll have some really cool stuff coming out. All right. Anyways, <laughs> I keep getting distracted. Um, right. So let's do a vellum. Uh, oops. Vellum flu- configure fluid. Drop this down. And uh, sometimes you'll notice that this takes a second to, to start up. I think the reason for it is that this has kind of like a compiling step that it has to go through. I've actually had Houdini open already and was screwing around with it a little before. So I didn't go through that. But sometimes it takes a little bit to kind of boot itself up so just keep that in mind um maybe we'll do something like 0.02 for the particle separation we don't need to go too crazy with this so now we have our particles right so this is this is kind of the obviously the main step of creating our our attributes that we need to be able to go into um, our vellum solver right so let's take a look at some of these things that are being created here so you'll see that they're pretty standard stuff right so we've got um mass p scale uh, velocity, which is just at zero right now, and a new attribute that you probably haven't seen before. I don't think there's any other. Yeah, I think fluid are the only ones that use phase. Um, and what this is, what this is basically saying is, um, you can kind of you can group your different uh, fluids that are in your scene together with this phase um, integer attribute, and. Basically, you know, it starts at one and goes up and allows you to basically say, hey, this all of these particles belong to the same fluid. Uh, So they should kind of be treated as such that they're all one one object. Right. Or one kind of um, piece of this simulation. Now, obviously, these these um, fluids can get broken apart and can um, can mix if you have multiple fluids. And we'll do that a little bit later. But. Um, what this is telling it is basically just what specific fluid, um, you know, kind of grouping we're looking at here. So this is the phase, this is, uh, just the first fluid phase basically that we have in here. We're not only going to have one for this. Um, so that is, um, important here. Another thing that's important to take a look at is the packing density. By default, if you're in the, in a grain setup, you'll see that the packing density is one. Now, when we're working with fluid, you want to turn this up a little bit because this will fill in, um, you know, your sphere a bit more or shape, whatever shape you're working with. Um, 
and also the jitter scale um, is going to help as well. Um, if you're finding that there's like some terracing on on your um, you know, your geometry or whatever, dithering it, dithering the surface is going to be helpful as well. Um, make sure that you don't have any like weird, like terracing kind of, you know, uh, surface features and things like that. Um, so, right. So this is pretty straightforward. We're creating our points from uh, a volume in this case. Um, you can also do it from uh, points that are coming into this node. Uh, and we'll take a look at that maybe in a, in a, in a few minutes or in a little bit. Um, but so that's all working good. And the physical attributes is, is also really important to uh, kind of work with here. So with the mass, um, having it at calculate uniform is probably um, your best um, bet. You could um, set it uniformly, but we're going to calculate it based on the density because obviously with fluids, your density is going to be really important to say, you know, which floats over top of which, you know, if one thing floats to the top versus another, um, that's where density um, comes in uh, particularly um, handy. At, like if you're doing oil and water type of a thing, that's why those separate out. Um, so that is... Um, one thing and here you can see where we can set the phase we can set this integer attribute up and down the density is going to adjust uh, the mass here so uh, we want to keep it around a thousand that's pretty standard for water um, you know for liquid water but the other thing here too is that we have viscosity surface tension those are pretty common uh, attributes to use as well and if we turn those on those are going to be those parameters here we're going to see that those are going to be added in um, into our uh, attributes as well. Uh, so I might just have some surface tension in this case, maybe something like 20. I don't know, just a little bit of surface tension just to give, to make, um, you know, our, uh, droplets and things like that kind of adhere together a little bit more. Um, so that all seems to be working just fine. Uh, we'll look at the other things here. We don't have any vertex attributes. We don't have any primitive attributes and for detail attributes, we just have, um, two, one that's basically just bam. It looks like a Ver map detail, which is just mapping uh, attribute. But the other one that's kind of important is this GL sphere points, and that's set to one. Um, that is actually how we're getting this spherical representation here. That's the attribute that controls that. So that's actually a detail attribute. So, um, so yeah, so that's pretty much it as far as attributes go that are coming out of this um, fluid configuration. So I'll just call this initialize fluid. Um, we, this really won't matter too much naming these because, uh, we won't actually have, um, we won't actually have any like named information in here. There's no constraints technically that are getting made in this as well. Um, so everything is being done on the, uh, on the points themselves. So let's now go and get a vellum solver and oops, missed the middle one there. Let's wire these in, right? And let's let's just add a ground to this and we'll just let it kind of fall and splash and do its thing, right? So there we go. Falls, does its thing, right? It kind of all spreads apart. And yeah, we've kind of got our our fluid here, right? So so this is all working just fine, right? So we've got a decent little simulation going here. However, what if we, um, you know, wanted to emit frame by frame, right? Well, the first thing we would want to do is not have this just be one, you know, obviously this, we don't want just this one instance of these points to be kind of starting there. We want to be emitting, you know, every frame or maybe every subframe, depending on uh, what we're, what we're looking for. Um, so if you remember when we were doing this with grains, what we did is we actually cut these two wires right here. And now this looks like this is going to give you an error, but in fact, it's not giving you this true error here. So if we have the collisions wired in, that'll be fine and will work kind of the way we want it to. Now what we need to do is grab a null off of here uh, and kind of the, the suggested naming here. Um, just to keep keep it straight is just to call this one geo and then we'll use this one and call this one con for constraints uh, if you look up in the uh, in the help documentation and things like that they kind of reference this kind of setup uh, quite a few times um, and so 
could be good just to kind of keep the naming consistent so you kind of remember what is connected where. And if we dive inside of this Vellum Solver, uh, we'll get to this um, uh, forces kind of uh, subnetwork inside of here that not only lets us put in forces, but also sets sources, which rhymes. Uh, so let's do that. Let's do a Vellum source. So we're gonna grab a Vellum source node, wire it into here. And so we're gonna target both of those um, both of those SOPs, so uh, those nulls. So let's grab the geo, that'll go into our SOP path. The constraints, it's not really important, but we'll do this. We'll have the constraints there just for, just for cleanliness. And uh, now we have our simulation being sourced uh, from inside. And if we hit play, we're gonna get basically the same exact thing. There's not gonna be any difference here because we're looking at, um, I'm just gonna turn this grid off here because we're looking at the exact same um, thing where it's only sourcing once. So if you noticed when we drop that down, I'll go back here, um, when we drop this vellum source down, uh, this has the emission type here. We're gonna say, um, uh, let's just do each frame for right now. And we'll do an activation of dollar sign FF, which is float frames less than 24. So if the frames are less than 24, this will be on. So it's gonna emit for 24 frames. So let's just let this do its thing um, and we can see what happens. So there we go, we get a little emission. And there we go. And you can see here, we're actually seeing that surface tension in action, right? Um, if you don't remember from like physics or, you know, things like that in school, uh, surface tension is just the thing that uh, that kind of brings, you know, kind of uh, attracts liquids together to create these drops and kind of uh, this, this ring that's sort of going around it here. Um, so that is uh, being caused by the surface tension. Now, if we were to go back here and turn the surface tension off, uh, we should see quite a little bit of a different uh, setup here. It shouldn't attract quite as much. And yeah, it does have a little bit of surface tension kind of by default. Uh, this ring still does exist, but um, these individual drops are quite a bit less. So if we go to surface tension now and turn that back on, we'll see that we'll get a quite a bit more um, you know, of these kind of drops here that are forming, these individual drops. So uh, not only is this ring maybe a little bit better defined, but also in between here, we're getting more and more drops. And as we turn this up higher and higher, um, we're gonna get more and more of that. So now at this point, we're getting almost all drops and there's none, none of that little ring. And uh, it's a bit too high here because we're having uh, some weird jittering happening. Uh, another thing that I should have brought up from the very start here is talking about the actual solver settings. So this is something that's really interesting because it's it kind of differs based on um, what type of um, you know solver you or what type of um, object you're trying to solve for. So in this case, um, if we have basically just a pure uh, fluid simulation, um, kind of a good starting point uh, from in, from reading through the documentations. Uh, is actually setting this to five, so five sub-steps, 20 constraint iterations, because we don't need to have quite as many, and actually zero smoothing iterations, totally unnecessary to have smoothing when it's only fluid. So this should should be a bit um, more accurate now, and I'm not sure if this will still jitter quite as much, um, but let's see. So now, as we have, you know, some 100, um, uh, we have our, you know, our surface tension set to 100. Uh, we can actually see that this has changed quite a bit because as we're upping the sub steps, that's 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 increasing the accuracy, right, of what we're simulating here. So um, it's going to take a little longer. You can see it's going just a, a bit slower here, but um, we're going to have a much higher accuracy um, to what this is solving to. The other thing you'll notice is that this. Um, that I, I'm not sure um, really how to describe this, but kind of by default, um, this solver tends to have this kind of thicker edge here, um, kind of a more dense edge with points, and then it's a little bit more sparse in between. It's not totally um, visible 
everywhere but i think like these you can see that there's definitely like this outer shape that's being created there and i feel like with surface tension uh type effects this is actually going to be a lot better because you want to have uh more density at the edges so um, if you're doing drops and things like that um, on maybe smaller scale fluids uh, it's certainly going to be a benefit um, for you to be able to have that when you're meshing it so it's that's a, that's will come in handy at mesh at the meshing stage um so let's just just for um kind of to get the full picture here let's set this back down to 20 just to see how this differs here so we can get a better view of this so we'll let that all kind of splash down cool so you can see here that this is now able to this is kind of a bit more spread apart it's not so attracted all together so you can see here that the there's quite a few more uh, individual kind of like little rivulets and and kind of blobs around here so it's not hasn't you know kind of condensed quite as much and i believe if now we turn this off we'll see um, even less of that um, just to kind of give a full picture of what this setting is going to be doing here And it will clump together, um, but I think you'll see that most of it is just going to be in this kind of outer ring here, and the rest is kind of all um, just stationary in the middle. So we've hopefully you're seeing how you can kind of create stronger like tendrils and drops by upping the surface tension, right? And conversely, if we're going to turn the viscosity up a bit, let's set this up to 10 maybe, for example. Um, this is going to um, create, you know, more and more of a kind of condensed, um, just, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of coherent um, liquid that's all going to be coming together. Now, in this case, it's not quite high enough to really stick it together. We're still just having this like ring, but you can see that basically what uh, viscosity is doing is kind of uh, smoothing the... Um, the velocities and and point positions across neighbors so now we're getting quite a bit more of like a dripping kind of simulation here and the higher this goes the more this is going to feel like syrup or honey or something like that um so here we're getting a little bit more uh that viscosity and as we go up higher and higher here uh, we'll see that this is going to uh, converge more and more on kind of this blobby sort of state so this should be quite a bit more like syrup or honey or something like that at this stage and there we go now we have quite a bit more of a a blob happening here so you know these are again pretty standard um, examples just a good thing to kind of see what exactly is happening here and how um, you know we can make these attributes kind of work for us and obviously you might want some surface tension in there as well i was kind of just isolating those from each other um, but surface tension will certainly help with viscosity and and uh, sometimes vice versa if you want to add a little um, you know viscosity into your surface tension to make it a little bit more you know individual blobs and things like that that can help so there we go we've got our simulation working here Pretty straightforward to get going there's not a huge um you know huge amount of setup here we have a fluid we've got a solver we've got a source it's pretty much it um the one thing um that you might be thinking though is that hey this is the uh collision geometry input we've got this wired in here so what how does that work exactly so what i'm going to do is i'm going to turn the viscosity back off and let's maybe up the surface tension just a little bit maybe to like i don't know we'll do 50 for right now and what I'm going to do is I'm going to build um, something that this can collide with instead of um, having just a ground. So let's, let's actually make a piece of geometry that it can collide with. So let's do a box. I think that's the easiest. And let's just kind of see what we got going on here. Let's take the top of this box off. I'm just going to select that. Actually, select with S and delete that. Oops. weird 
not sure why it's doing that. Uh, let's just grab blast node. We'll just blast the top here. Cool. And then I'm going to use a th the labs thicken, which I very much like. Excuse me. What the heck? That was not nice. Okay. There we go. I just hit escape to get us out of that weird little state. Looked like it just kind of hung there on, in the viewport. Anyways, um, labs thicken. We're going to set this to primitive edge normal. Um, that just kind of makes sure that without specifying normals that it's uh, kind of able to make this you know better box for us here maybe we'll do a 0 0.25 just give it a decent amount of thickness and we'll just make this uh, let's see here make sure it got that do this and then we'll make this a little wider here Oops, don't want to rotate it. Cool. So we'll just make a little box for this, like so. And we'll drop that fluid into it. Let's see what happens. Just kind of making a random little piece of geometry here. Okay, so this is what we're going to use for our collision geometry. We're really reinventing the wheel, but hey, it's geometry and it's going to do the job. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to take this, um, this kind of collision geometry output, shift-click this, and then alt click to grab a merge and then connect it together like this. Now there's nothing actually coming out of this uh, output. Just for an example, you can see here that there is literally nothing. So we're merging nothing with our geometry and then putting that into the solver here. So now we have our collision geometry. And let's play this forward here. We should see that we're getting some collisions. And there we go. Obviously, uh, this isn't going to be the most interesting uh, simulation in the world. Um, I'm going to give this a little bit more time. Let's say FF36, something like that. And we'll let that go. Just to give it a little bit more fluid to fill up this collision area. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, Ruben is asking, how would you fill up the box completely? Um, well, so there's, I mean, there's actually two different ways that you could probably do that. Um, you could use some sort of a, um, you know, you could fill it up if you needed. Um, however, that's probably not going to do exactly what you want it to do, right? Because that's, um, you know, if you're trying to fill it up from the top, you're just going to keep filling and filling and filling and filling, right? So, um Probably your easiest way to do that uh, would actually be to start a little bit differently. So um, let's just take a look at maybe how we might go about doing that. So, all right, we've got our fluid going here, right? It's all looking fine. But instead, what if we took this box, right? If we look at the merge here, what we could do is we could take the inside of this and we could actually take these faces and turn it into our uh, starting geometry here. So let's do that. Let's give that a shot. So instead of using, let's see, we're going to select these faces here. Oops, I hit F1 by accident. Sorry, my bad. It's weird. This is like, let's do a blast. 
So what I'm going to do, I'm just selecting those faces there. We're going to delete non-selected, right? So I selected the inside faces. So I'm just going to delete the non-selected. Hey, Dr. J, Dr. J Leggett. <laughs> Welcome to the stream. Thanks for joining. Yeah. Hello. Um, okay. So I'm just going to blast these out. I'm going to do a bound and that should get us where we want to go. So I could actually remove this sphere and instead initialize the fluid based on that, right? And if I wanted to reduce the, you know, the upper size of this, I could a little bit, right? I could reduce this by, I don't know, 0.2, something like that. So here's our, here's our box, there's our, there's our points, um, merging it back together. Um, but again, that's just merging this collision geometry with um, basically nothing. So let's go back down here to Vellum Solver. I'm actually going to say, don't do this each frame, do this only once. Uh, the activation won't really matter because it's only gonna do it once. But now we should have this box filled. Obviously we're getting a little bit of compression there. Um, because there is a little bit of space in between our um, particles and things like that. But um, the higher your packing is done um, in this fluid, the better, um, the less space there should be inside of there. So that would be what I would do basically um, is just kind of play around with that a little bit. Yeah, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, if you... Um, if you wanted to just keep this up to the top and let it kind of just settle down inside of there, that might be your best bet. Um, the better you can pack that the, the points in there, probably the more points there's going to be, the more space will be filled. Um, but that's kind of your, your best bet for being able to, uh, being able to quickly fill up the whole thing. So hopefully that makes sense. Good, good little, uh, example there. Um, but yeah, it's a great question. Thanks for asking that, Ruben. I appreciate that. So um, the other thing, obviously, we could do in this 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 scenario is instead of having this vellum source here, we could just wire these two in here, and that's going to be the exact same thing. Might be a little faster, maybe. Uh, no, not quite. So one thing um, that can that you can that I find can help a little bit with uh, these fluid simulations sometimes with the speed and things like that um, is if you go under the advanced, go under fluids and just have the spatial sort interval on. Um, basically, it's able to um, uh, more quickly once these these points are all within are sorted within their own, you know, kind of relation to each other or within some sort of spatial, you know, um, coordinates, uh, the, if the processor, you know, if the GPU is calculating all this stuff, uh, or the CPU is calculating all this stuff based on proximity, um, if they're sorted by proximity and similar, you know, closely, uh, adjacent points are all kind of sorted in, in the right number, uh, that can actually help improve your speeds and things like that. So, um, just something to keep in mind, having that spatial sort can, can help as well. Um, it's not always going to do very much. Like in this case, it's already pretty sorted. Um, so just keep that in mind that if things are splashing around and moving around, that can, that can help a, a good amount. Um, obviously in this case, we've got a few hundred thousand points. So that's really the thing that's taking the most time in this, um, in this simulation. But, um, just something good to know that's there, I guess, basically. So let's uh, let's go back here a second. And I'm going to go back to where we had this. Okay, cool. So good, we'll get rid of that for right now. We'll cut this off and go back to the sphere here. So we've got our sphere geometry again. And we should be emitting, nope, just once. So let's go back in here, set this to each frame. And instead of doing it each frame, let's actually go to each sub-step. Let's see how, see how this changes. Uh, it should be a little bit smoother because this is going to, um, it's going to actually uh, emit fluid every, it's gonna emit fluid five times every um, 
every frame instead of just once. So that should um, create a little bit of a better and smoother emission source. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind um, as you're as you're kind of uh, working with this. Um, however, it's not always going to you know it's not going to be a one to one um, with how Flip works, for example, in the way that that emits and and the way that it you know, calculates and stuff. So it's a different solver. It's a different beast. Um, I would say that if you're trying to do something that's like more like a flat tank like this, um, it's probably not going to be your best bet. You know, I, I, I don't think, I think you're going to probably be happier if you can work with your flip fluid. Now, again, scale could be a problem as well. Um, this is a relatively small simulation for a flip. Um, I mean, it is still in like the meter range, but um, flip, sometimes can get a little funky if you have it um, small. So this will work a bit better as you get into smaller scales. So anyways, um, just something to keep in mind with this. And I'm going to turn that spatial sort interval back on just to see if that helps us at all here. Should give us a little, little bit of speed, I think. So another thing to keep in mind as you're working with um, these these fluid simulations is um yeah it actually does seem like it's giving us a little extra a little extra speed um something to keep in mind as you're sourcing this is the particle density so if we were to do something like 1.5 on this uh, this is actually going to up the density here and now obviously they're overlapping particles and they're going to explode so that's obviously not what we want uh, but in this case maybe something like uh, 0 0.9 could be good we could try that uh, just to kind of make sure that there's not too many overlapping, that, that could be good if you need to reduce it a little bit uh, to make your, your you know, maybe this is packed too tightly and it's it's exploding a little bit. Um, or if it's not packed enough, you could just give it a little push and that might be enough to kind of get your, your simulation doing what you want it to. So just something to keep in mind as you're working with this um, emitter. It's a little different than the way Flip um, emits and things like that. So uh, just something to kind of keep in mind that the particle density um, is actually controllable right here as well. So you can kind of play around with that, see how that works out for you. Now, another thing um, that'll help with this as well is if we watch this fluid right here, we'll see that this is just stationary. And really what we want this to do is not be exactly the same on every frame. So let's do this. Let's do dollar sign uh, T, I think should work. Um, let's look at our look at fractional frames and see if this is updating every fractional frame and sure enough it is so that's good uh, you could I think also do FF which is float frames and that should update every fractional frame uh, I think dollar sign F will not but watch Houdini show be nope nope definitely not so F will not work because it is um, rounding right and so what we want to do is something like FF, which is going to be an actual fractional frame here. So, so FF or T in this case would work, work best. And what this is going to do is make sure that this is, um, that this is changing every frame, because if these point positions are in exactly the same spot, uh, they're going to be more likely to, um, kind of collide and push into each other and stuff like that and cause some chaos as they're being emitted. So, having that um that positional jitter as you're emitting is going to be um a much better setup uh for you uh in the long run with your fluid and stuff like that so um if we do that and let's just play with the particle density here actually i think we could go up a little higher with this and it should not explode quite as much let's just see here <laughs> get a little explosion at the beginning there but Looks like it kind of comes down here so that might be a little bit more uh, density for your simulation could be better could be worse kind of have to see uh you know what your you know what re the result you're getting is how it's working for you but good to know that that's there right so um in this case we have that going on let's just take a look at what's happening here with the simulation All right, so there we go. That's that's you know kind of the most basic setup um, that we we might have. 
Uh, there's just a sphere meaning, you know, getting some uh, points created inside of it um, and getting those those attributes uh, from the Vellum configure grain node. Uh, and then we're just basically taking that, sourcing it inside of our Vellum solver and merging in uh, some collision geometry. And that is, you know, the most simple kind of basic thing that you could do um, with something like this, uh, you know, with this Vellum fluids. Uh, however, let's do something a little more interesting. I think this this is kind of a little on the boring side. So let's uh, let's do something a little bit more interesting. So let's do another geometry node here and we'll say um, we'll say simple zero G fluid. I'm just gonna hide this. Let's jump inside of here. We'll do a sphere again. Uh, this one I'm gonna keep a little bit bigger just so that we have a little bit more you know, surface area to it. And let's do, let's do this. Let's do another vellum fluid. Drop this down. I'm gonna do again, maybe 0 0.01. Yeah, that seems okay. I think that'll be all right. Maybe we'll start with 0.15 just to get the effect going the way we want it to. Uh, you can actually see here that at this resolution we're seeing the faceting. So um, what you'll want to do is actually uh, probably set this to something like the polygon mode. I find is a little more a little more pleasing visually. Um, so let's look at that. Yeah, I think you'll you'll see that that becomes quite a bit less uh, noticeable as you start with something like a uh, triangulated mesh for the polygon or for in polygon mode. All right, so we have our volume fluid here. Let's say initialize zero G fluid. And this we're just going to start. Um... <laughs> Lord help me, I'm currently working a GTX 1080 16 gig RAM setup. I'm crying. Yeah, so that's probably... Yeah, I think it's mostly the the GPU in this case. Um, unfortunately, yeah, there's uh, certainly GPU acceleration on this, um, and the RAM should not be. Just as a note, the RAM shouldn't be anything that you're overly or should be a big problem for you. Um, I'm not sure where I'm at right now with my actual Houdini. Yeah, so I mean, I'm using a couple other things here, but. My Houdini is at six gigs of RAM, so I mean, I think you'll be okay with RAM-wise, but yeah, definitely GPU is gonna is gonna hurt that, um, and CPU as well because it's not all GPU open like OpenCL stuff. So certainly something, yeah, that's that's definitely uh, not gonna be the most fun thing. Now, if you want to play around with it, lower particle numbers is gonna be the key to making that you know work out for you. I am on a 3090 and a Threadripper, so I do have a little bit of horsepower so my apologies you know your your uh you know results may vary uh with that in mind let's actually just cut this down a little bit we'll do this at ah oh, yeah yeah that's all of that unfortunately together is going to cause um you know cause a little bit of uh uh struggling for you but it should still work it just will take a little bit longer so you know, get a file cache node, and once you get the effect looking the way you want it to, you can always file cache and things like that. Sorry, just uh, opening a uh, flavored water here if you hear weird fizzing in the background. All right, so let's do something a little bit more, a little different here. So let's, um, let's instead... Um, uh, let's see here. Let's do surface tension again. 25. That's cool. Um, ah, Jamal, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I did make, um, I did do a USD series for side effects. Yeah, I'm glad it helped. Yeah, it, it definitely was a lot of work for me as well to get all that information in my brain. And I was, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have access to some of the uh, developers and things like that. So very much a team effort not just my brain coming up with that stuff a lot of people on on our side so yeah glad it was helpful um okay so let's take this and let's add some 
let's see, what do we want to do here? Let's do a vellum solver after this. And what we're going to do is let's turn off gravity. So if we do this, this should only emit once and we should just be able to play this and it'll pretty much just chill here in space, right? So we've just got a floating sphere at this point, right? So it's sort of just adhered to itself. Everything's good. So um, let's uh, change this up a little bit or let's kind of make this work for us. I think if we input a velocity here, um, it should come through. Now I could be wrong and we might have to put that afterwards. So we'll figure that out, but let's try this first. I'm pretty sure that this is the way that this will work. So let's do normal. So I'm going to put a normal down here, put it in point mode just to make some point normals on this sphere, right? So we've got our point normals. And then what I can do is just do an attribute rename and just change the normal from N to V. So now we should have velocity P and V. So let's see if that works here. No, bummer. I was thinking that that would work. Okay, no problem. Um, so what we can do instead, uh, instead of that, since we have this and turn this off and see, yep, we don't have velocity attributes. That's okay. All right, so what we'll do instead, since we have velocity here, is I'm just gonna do an attribute transfer because we know that we need the velocity here. So we're gonna transfer the attribute there and this is going to come from up above. So what I will do is that and we'll attribute transfer on the velocity, turn this off. Now we should be sourcing in our velocity here. So if we look at this, <laughs> kind of crazy looking, but we've got some exploding fluids. <laughs> uh, let me set these uh, simulation settings to, uh, <laughs> that's kind of fun looking. Um, let's set these to a little bit more appropriate based on what the documentation says. So let's do that. There we go. Another thing too to uh, keep a keep a note of if you um, if you wanted to uh, change, sorry, if you wanted to make this a little bit more efficient, turning the subsets down would certainly um, create a, a faster simulation, right? Because if I have this subset sub steps at one, uh, this is going to go way faster, right? Uh, it's not going to be accurate. Uh, so the higher it goes, the more accurate you're going to get with it. Um, however, if you want just a quick idea of what's going on, you could certainly run this with a low substep um, in order to get your um, initial kind of setup going. And then you could always go up to 10 or something like that. And that's even going to kind of chug on my machine, right? But this is going to be a better and better um, setup, right? This is going to be better and better quality kind of and a more accurate quote unquote um, result. So, you know, you can obviously work kind of in different varying levels of quality here and get a very similar look, um, but just a couple details will be different as you kind of go into these other higher sub steps. Um, so, and just remember when we're saying sub steps, right? Each frame, basically it's cutting it up into five pieces. And so in this case, um, you know, taking it's the movement of this simulation and, and cutting it and simming it five times within each frame is going to allow it, allow motion to be able to be more curved, smoother, um, and allow the forces to be able to kind of balance out over those frames. So, um, you know, that's, that's really kind of what we're talking about here and allowing things to, um, you know, kind of have this more natural movement and have forces act a bit more appropriately and in smaller little chunks so that we can kind of calculate them uh, better and better, especially with like, if you have really fast motion or whatever, more sub steps are going to, to help with that. Anyways, um, what I'm going to do here is just, um, I'm just going to multiply um, this velocity here. So I'm going to just say, uh, I'm going to use my adjust vector, attribute adjust vector. And this way we can just really simply take these 
uh, velocities here, right? So we should have a bunch of velocities here. Let me see if I can see this. Uh, what's the best way to do this? There we go. I just turned on this visualizer and uh, I just happen to have V in there, but you could do that same thing by just clicking on this and saying V and then turning your visualizer on, right? Um, now in this case, it's once you turn your visualizer on, it's hiding that sphere. And so I'm able to actually see these, uh, these trails. So we can see that, that those, um, those are all kind of pushing outwards. Um, maybe I'm gonna change my background here just so they're a little bit easier to see. So maybe something like that. Yeah, that's probably better. So, okay, so let's multiply this. So we're gonna say instead of add uh, for our V is the default is V and attribute adjust vector. So instead of that, we'll do multiply. And uh, we can just do this as a constant and say something like, well, actually what we could do is just set these all at the same time. And if we have, well, let's cut this maybe by a third-ish. So there we go. That's gonna be a little bit of a random, sorry, that's gonna be less of a velocity here outwards. So now we should have this sphere kind of go out. And because it's zero G, it's probably just gonna sort of come apart. It's kind of fun looking. <laughs> it's kind of cool. That's kind of a neat little effect there, just a little little poof, and then it kind of all spreads apart. Kind of fun. Um, so really all we're doing here is just adding a uniform velocity um, to each of these points kind of that's going outwards. And just because of the random nature of where they are, we're getting some interesting little features here. Um, and maybe what we wanna do is even make this less. So I'm just clicking on this. I'll make this go down another 10th here. And uh, we'll play this back and see what happens here. Now the tricky thing that we're dealing with as well is that this is just kind of, <laughs> that's kind of funky looking. What are we seeing in there? Okay, that must've just been an original. Oh, that's really weird. It's making this bizarre shape. I actually liked it better with the uh, point 0.3. So, sorry, uh, let's see here. We'll say scale V. Yeah, exactly. So that's gonna be our next step is, is instead of just having it be, oh, what the heck? I swear, there's something going on with my graphics card. I, I need to, it's definitely something like that. Because every time I'm working with Vellum, it's doing something funky. Yes, so we're gonna multiply it by um, some noise. We could do alligator noise, we could do uh, curl noise. Curl noise is, I think, gonna be better for this, but, um, sorry, ton of dust on top of my camera here. <laughs> sorry for my finger sticking in, in, the, in the way. All right, let's open that crash file back up, and I'm gonna save this back out. Yes, 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 save as, there we go, overwrite, cool, uh, sorry about that. Just kind of reorganize this a little bit here, cool. All right, so, um, yeah, scale V, transfer V, uh, rename, oops. To V, just making some uh, little kind of renaming these things. Cool. All right, so let's scale this up by a one. And what we can do inside of here is actually do a pop drag. So this will be a nice um, little bit of uh, resistance here. So maybe I'll do something like 0 0.2 on this just to give it a little bit of drag to kind of slow it down. And this should allow for it to expand and then come to rest a little bit more uh, maybe than it did did previously. So we're just adding in a little bit of drag to kind of slow these particles down and you can you can you know create that however you might want it to be. 
So there we go, something kind of interesting. Um, and then we can do the same thing here. We can do an attribute adjust vector. I tend to like these a little bit more than the noise, the attribute noise, uh, because I feel like the parameters are a little easier to set and it's a little easier to tell what's happening in my opinion, but either one would work just fine. So we'll say uh, noise V. So again, we're on V. Uh, let's just turn this on. We've got our points here, and then I'm going to turn this on as well here, so we can kind of see our um, our individual vectors, and we can sort of see what's happening here, um, like that. And let's do something like this. We'll say direction and length sounds good. Uh, we'll multiply it. We'll multiply it by some noise. Uh, why don't we zero center that? I think should be good. We don't want one for the amplitude. That's going to be a bit too much. Am I thinking of this the wrong way? Yes, I am thinking of this the wrong way. We want to add the noise in. That'll be the best way to do this. So we'll add some noise in, zero centered. And as we kind of adjust this, this is going to add some parts that will have more or less noise. We can change the scale of this down a little bit. So if we were going to do something you know, like this, we can kind of tweak how these are sort of flowing in here. It's a little tough to see maybe, but um, we'll kind of play around with this a little bit and see what we can get. There you can start to see the kind of scale of that, I think, a little bit. So we probably don't want quite that much, but a little bit here, and we can kind of set up a little bit of noise in here. Let's do, we could do simplex. The other thing we could do, I guess, is do this with a curl noise and a VOP, but let's just do it this way and see, see what happens. If we want to tweak it, we can. Oops. Just gonna turn that off and let's take a look at what happens here. So now we should have a much more interesting kind of flow going on here. Um, there's some more random noise put in there and, uh, yeah, so we can kind of just keep, keep tweaking this a little bit. So maybe instead we want to, uh, do something like, sorry, I'm just going to turn this back on and let's see here. We'll do this 0 0.7. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, there you go. Starting to get something a little more interesting going on there. So this is how you might do something, um, you know, with a, with a 0G noise. Um, you might want to have like a splash or something like that. You could always, you know, have your, um, you know, you could have like a disc or something like that, that kind of splashes out, you know, however, you know, there's, there's obviously so many different ways that you could go about doing this, but, um, kind of combining the idea of, um, initial velocities with, um, with the drag forces, with noise, all these things kind of come together to be able to, um, yeah, it definitely does, right? It looks almost like a slow-mo guy video. That's totally right. Um, the other thing too is if I, let's let's do this. Let's turn the air resistance up a little bit. So I feel like it's not actually coming to rest as much as I would like for it to. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Like you can kind of create these random little things like this. Obviously this this isn't a, a huge network, right? This is pretty pretty small. Um, but yeah, um, I think it is cool the way that you can kind of prototype things so quickly and kind of start getting ideas and, um, you know, as you get something like this and you want to go more and more in depth with it, you could up, up the particles, you know, up your sub steps, things like that. And, uh, yeah, you can just kind of keep iterating on it. So there is, um, you know, the, you know, we're getting this kind of slowing type of a thing there yeah so that's doing i think what we would like for it to do um the only other thing that 
I'm actually going to turn that off. I wonder if that was actually causing it to not get the drag properly. All right, let's just, I'm just going to go all the way back up. Oops. Go all the way back up with this. Hello? Why is that doing that? Control middle click. Shift middle clicking like a, like a goof. All right. So, so this is, um, hopefully this will be even slow, like kind of slow down even more and come to rest. Yeah. I think that is kind of hard to tell a little bit but um the other thing that can be really helpful is actually working with this time scale thing here so if we put this way down to like 0.25 this is going to feel even like it's going to feel even more slow motion right obviously because we're slowing time down but it's also going to give it the effect of feeling a little bit maybe bigger um, because as things slow down, right, the kind of physics moves, as things are moving slower, kind of, but at roughly the same size visually, it almost feels like you're scaling up what you're doing here. So in this case, we've got the time scale down way lower. It's not going to quite evolve as much, um, but we're going to get kind of this super slow motion simulation thing going on here, but it's still going to have some of the same feeling of what we had before with the, uh, you know, where it evolved even further up to this 240 frames. So now we're moving kind of at a quarter speed, but we're getting um, some similar results, but just much, much slower evolving, right? Since it's, um, you know, since it's at a quarter of the speed, it takes way longer for this to all kind of, um, you know, evolve to that same, that same state. So yeah, all these things together can combine, can help you kind of get that look that you're going for. If you want something that feels a little bit more of that kind of slow motion bullet time type thing, um, you could do something um, where you change the time scale. And we'll actually um, use this in the next example as well um, to kind of play around with this a little bit more. But um, yeah, so this um, this is just kind of like an idea for something that you might have like you know, more abstract, zero G kind of weird fluid flowing around. I think it's fun to look at, pretty interesting. Um, so let's take that idea and let's add um, a way to maybe art direct this a little bit. So instead of just having this be, um, you know, a blob that starts out, let's emit and let's have a curve that actually allows us to um, kind of move, move this around, right? So let's... Um, Let's make a new geo node. We'll say guided zero G fluid. This is actually um, in the documentation, the Houdini documentation. This example, uh, I'm going to kind of tweak it a little bit. Um, they use a they use a um, a helix in order to do this. I'm just going to kind of randomly make a curve. I think will be fine. But um, but yeah, so they um, the documentation team they they made this example of kind of a helixed um, uh, basically curve that this fluid will follow. We're going to do something just a little bit different, I think. I'm just going to kind of go off, off script a little here. All right, so again, we're just starting with a sphere, nothing crazy. So let's take a sphere. Maybe we'll set it down, scale it down a little bit. Uh, so it's a smaller emission size, maybe something like that. Let's do a let's do a vellum. Yeah, I can type vellum fluid. Let's do that. Cool. Uh, let's do zero point zero zero seven something in that range. Looks good. Let's do polygon and maybe you know give it a few more divisions here just so it smooth the sphere out. Um, let's do surface tension again at like 25, eh, let's do 50. Um, and the seed we'll do dollar sign FF just to make sure that that's updating every, every frame or sub step. Um, I 
just curious. <laughs> just changing that for kicks. I just hadn't changed that yet. Um, okay, cool. So we've got our sphere here. So let's take this and let's also, um, let's make a curve that we want this, this emission to follow. So let's do that. So let's make a curve. Um, yeah, let's do a Bezier curve. That should be good. We'll just template this and go into the curve. And we'll draw some sort of a little curve situation here. So we'll do something over here maybe. I don't know. Just going to make some random little curve type things. Oops. If I want to go back and edit this, I just can hit F go into my edit mode and then go back to G and that goes back into the draw mode. So, oops, G, click on that. Sorry, I don't use this as much as I should. There we go. And maybe we'll just have this like cross back over and go over here, something like that. Cool, great. So let us, Let's do F to go into edit and then ba, ba, ba. we'll go to K to show the transform handle and I'm just going to select some of these and just kind of move them around. Uh, we'll have this one go, oops, we'll have that up. We'll take this point here, make it go up as well. This one here. Just gonna kind of play around with this a little bit, make it something sort of interesting, I guess. Okay. Sure. It's interesting enough, I guess. Something like that. Cool. All right. So we got a curve. Uh, let's just do a resample on this. That'll give us some points here. So we've got that going. Let's do, I guess we could do it subdivision. That'll at least smooth it out if. No, it's not going to matter. Cool. All right. So we'll just do that. That's cool enough. A little curve. Let's just do a um, uh, actually I'm just going to use the mountain sop. I think that will give us kind of what we want more or less and we will just adjust the amplitude here and oh, actually you know what there we go turn this noise long vector off We'll just give it a little, little something. Just make it a little more interesting with some noise here. In fact, what I'm going to do is actually put fewer points on this, something like that. And then I'm just going to add another resample here. And I'm just going to subdivision this and go to 0 0.1. So we'll just do something like that. Where we've got some noisiness. And this we can kind of control how much that smoothing happens. Cool. So that's kind of interesting. Got a random kind of curve. Um, and then I'm just going to do a null here, and this is going to serve as our curve. Uh, we'll say force curve. Okay, 
So we have our vellum fluid here. I'm going to do a vellum solver. Hmm, are there any errors or bad practices that I see beginners do a lot? Hmm. You know, honestly, I think a lot of times people don't um, people don't pay it close enough attention to like the scale and speed of their simulations. I feel like a lot of times those are things that um, that it takes a little bit for you to kind of um, understand how it's how it should work, like seeing like the emission of uh like smoke happening way too fast or like fluid just spraying out crazy fast and once you're doing that then you're running into problems of oh you don't have enough sub steps so if you do even want it to be fast you don't have enough sub steps to kind of resolve the speed of that smoke um because it's just blasting through way too many voxels or way too far in space um so i think a lot of time i think with simulation that's something i see a lot of times is that um, understanding scale and understanding when you need more sub steps to make fast high speed stuff work and look better. Also, people when they're doing pyro sims, they leave their like their billowing smoke as like these big mushroom caps, and you want to break those up with disturbance. I don't think I've really ever done a lot of pyro on here, but yeah, that's definitely something I've I've seen quite a few times that are like it's a big no no. Go see, uh, go watch um, Steve Nipping's. Uh, um, you know, that's a, that's a worthwhile purchase if you want to learn how to like make your pyro sims look a little nicer. Anyways, um, cool. So we've made our, our kind of standard setup here where we've got our geo and our, our, um, constraints and we're going to source them into this vellum solver. So here we're going to do a source, do a vellum source. We'll hook those up again. This is not reinventing the wheel or anything here, but we'll look at how this this works. Now, this also sort of works with flip, some of these techniques. Uh, it might look a little different the way you're gonna set it up, um, but doing a guided fluid or a zero G fluid, um, I think you can kind of get in a similar spot with, um, with flip if you kind of take some of these concepts and know where to put them in. Yeah, for sure, yeah, settings are like, it, you know, I guess, I guess the way to think of that is like, it's always hard to know which parameter to go in and kind of tweak. Um, because really, again, it's all attributes on geometry, attributes on volumes. It's it's all, Houdini is so much about parameters and attributes and just knowing kind of what parameter, setting what attribute and how to kind of manipulate those things. It's a huge, a huge learning curve when you're starting in Houdini. But I think the more you start from the beginning of that and don't just try to make some huge sim and be like, oh, this looks great. And then not really understand what's going on on any level of it. I think starting from the, from some of the more basics and simpler setups um, can be really fun, even though they're not as like visually exciting. I think it'll give you better results in the long term when you know uh, what's happening. All right, so we've got our source here. Uh, let's do it each sub step. That should be fine. Uh, let me set my vellum solver to kind of where we've been setting it to five, 20, and zero. Uh, again, I'm gonna set the gravity off. And, oh, you know, honestly, I don't know if I've done all of his stuff. So that's that's always cool too. Yeah, all of his stuff is amazing. Like. Steve Nipping stuff is fantastic. Like that is kind of where I started all of my, um, all of my simulation stuff in, uh, you know, exactly. Yeah. Tutorials are great, um, to like learn a specific technique, but if you don't understand the, the, like the fundamentals that are, that are, um, behind it, I think you run into some problems and that's kind of what i was trying to do here where we're building up from a more foundational level and talking about things step by step as we go through it so hopefully that's what i'm trying to help with here to kind of put some content out there that's more in that line than um than just a tutorial on how to make this type of a splash or whatever because it's great to have to know what parameters to set to what to get a certain look 
but if you don't know how else to tweak those parameters to make the attributes create what you know work the way you want them to it's really going to just kind of put you into one thing that you can do with certain you know you follow these steps you get the thing but you don't know how to tweak it properly so yeah all right so we've got our vellum source here that's set each sub step all good um so let's let's now add in this force because if we just hit play here we're going to be kind of at the same spot we were before um this time we're having emissions, so they're all kind of emitting in this sphere or whatever, but um, it really doesn't even look like we're adding all that many points in here, just a few points. So let's do this. Let's, um, let's do this. Let's make sure that we're, excuse me. Um, let's do this. We'll do float frame less than, I don't know, 40, something like that. Cool, so it'll emit for 40 frames. Uh, so now let's come inside of here and let's grab a pop curve, curve force. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up that uh, curve as this force curve right here that we want. So we're gonna put this into this and now we've got this mess of, <laughs> of guides basically. And what we're seeing here is that the max influence radius is too high. Uh, so if we set this down, we'll start to see this kind of converge back on our actual shape again that we made. So let's set this down and that's looking pretty good there. Um, so now we're seeing that we have this tube that, that this is going to get forced along. So let's, let's set some of these here. So, hmm. I'm going to kind of go off the the parameters that were set uh, from this other example that I was looking at in the in the um, documentation. This is just an educated guess based on those. So I'm just going to kind of set this back to where that was. Uh, so it was just four, 12 and three. But what each of these things are going to let's just go through each of these one by one, because that's kind of silly to uh, to just plug it in. That's kind of what we we're saying. So the follow scale, let's turn that up first. So what that follow scale is gonna do is actually pull this along, right? So it's following the curve. You can see that this is now pulling it in this direction along the curve. Um, and it's going to follow this kind of tube that's that's going here. So um, the problem that we might run into is that we don't have any suction. So that's not sucking it back towards that base curve so it's just kind of shooting off into space which is gonna look kind of cool right um but what we're what we want it to do is actually follow this so we need some suction in here to make sure that it's going to follow uh this curve so let's set this to five for right now we can kind of let this we'll go back here and let it do its thing so now we should have it kind of suction to the center spot the center of this spine here um, and really the balancing of those two um, should um, give you how much it's going to actually adhere to this um, this path, right? So it'll keep it in this rough area and this path so that it's going to kind of move along and follow this curve. So it's going to make some interesting uh, shapes and things like that. Now, it looks like we're actually having some that are breaking away here. So it looks like our suction isn't maybe quite to the level that we need it to be, right? So if we let this keep going, we might see that there's gonna be some little flyaways and stuff, which is fine, like it's probably okay. I don't think it's gonna be the end of the world. Um, but we probably need to up the suction just a little bit so that it follows any little random curve and things like that. So in this case, we have our follow scale, which is pushing it along that curve. We have the suction, which is actually pulling it back towards the center so it doesn't just fly off into space. So let's do this. Let's up the suction scale a little bit here. Mm, let's do it at like, let's do it, double it. We'll do eight. So hopefully now this will keep it pretty well contained within that kind of tube that we're creating there. Um, so we're getting, getting some, hopefully some nice little effects here. But the last, I think, kind of really cool thing that you can do with this is your inherit, or sorry, your orbit scale. So what you can do with that um, is actually tell it to orbit around that curve. In this case, 
we're just kind of letting it go off and kind of do its own thing. It's going to kind of naturally weave and kind of snake its way through this, um, through this, uh, kind of force field, if you, if you will, or this tube, uh, force that we've created, it's going to kind of go up and down and move around it uh, and kind of find its own way through it. However, um, it would be kind of neat to give it some rotational effect on top of this. So let's add some of that in. Let's do maybe three here. We'll see where that gets us. And now I think you'll see that there's an interesting kind of correlation here. So I think we're going to have some particles start flying off again. That's, that's my guess, but let's see what happens here. Let me just see what's going on here. Yep, we're getting some orbiting around, right? We're getting a little bit of orbit here, but it doesn't really seem to be enough yet. Let's just take a look at that. In fact, this is all moving way too quick. So let's slow this guy down. Uh, let's actually change this time scale here. Let's change this down because we don't need to go. Hey, Zach, how's it going? Welcome to the stream tonight. Nice to see you. So... I've turned the time scale down, so that's going to give us a little bit. Um, actually, it might be a little too much. Let's go, let's go back. Let's change it to half for right now. You can always tweak it as we go. Let's go back here. All right. Hopefully, this will be a little bit better. So what we should see is that this is going to start rotating around maybe a little bit more. But I think it's still not enough. Um so there is also this interesting um, kind of correlation between things where certain um, certain things uh, are more or less like the follow force fa fall off from curve um, that decreases as I as we go away from the curve. Um, if we look at the suction, that's going to increase as we go away from the curve. And then the orbit force is going to decrease as we go away from the curve. So the closer we are to the curve, the higher the orbit force will be. Um, so we need to almost have it suction a bit more to pull it to the center so that it orbits a bit more. So there's some weird kind of correlations there that'll happen. So, you know, we're not quite getting what we want here. So let's, let's up this suction scale just a little more see if that does what we want it to so it's always a balancing act and this i've i've talked about this in other simulations and things like that but it's always a balancing act to kind of know what things are affecting what in your simulation and how to kind of um balance those forces out and this it's kind of just the nature of the beast right that you're going to be taking time to kind of to kind of figure out what settings are right for your current setup now, in this case, um, you know, it might be, there might be more or less, um, you know, suction that we need, and we need to kind of play with that a little bit. Maybe we need a bit more orbit velocity, things like that. Those are things that you're going to kind of have to find out on your own and, and balance and tweak those things. So here we add a little suction. We might add a little bit more orbit. Maybe I want it to spin a bit more. Um, We'll kind of find where the where the kind of the perfect balance is for this. So let's let's just take a look at that one more time. Yeah, not bad, but let's up this a little more. Let's change this to five. Nope, that's thirty-five. <laughs> All right, let's do this. So so we're building this setup, right? We've got all these things kind of working together. However, um, I think the one thing that you'll start to notice is that this it feels like just a kind of a snake of fluid moving through here, which is not what we want. This is obviously not um, the scenario that we want here. So um, we should 
think about a way to kind of make this, um, to kind of break this up a little bit for us, right? So we want to add in some more forces here to make this um, simulation more interesting and do something that we, you know, something kind of work for us a little bit more. So a couple of things that I, you know, would do for this is first of all, add some noise. Um, but we also might want to add in a little bit of um, just a little bit of drag to kind of slow um, to slow it down before we add in the noise, just to make sure that we're kind of ha kind of controlling the curve force and then add in some noise from there. So let's do that. Um, let's add in, let's see here, let's just see how that's looking. Yeah, get some interesting little swirls and things like that. Let's just give this a little more suction maybe to make sure that it's staying close to the center point because we do want it. Oh, actually, you know what? It's like turning into a full tube, which is kind of not what we want either. So we'll turn that orbit scale down. We'll turn it to four maybe the suction scale to 11, something like that. Cool. Um, and what we can do to double check how this is moving is we could actually look at these um, velocities, right? We can see that a little bit more because it can be sort of tricky to see exactly what's happening here. So cool. We've got that swirling velocity that we want. Let's add in a pop drag. It's going to help just slow this down a little bit for us just to kind of give it a little bit more yeah a little more air resistance so we'll add in that a little bit and then let's add in some pop a pop force which is to just a generic force um, and we want to add in some noise with this I'm gonna hit escape here and just go back to one so we're not dealing with that all right so let's do amplitude I don't know let's do five for right now and just see where that kind of gets us see what that starts to do to this it should start to break up this this fluid and it'll allow us to get maybe a little bit more motion, uh, some more interesting motion added to it. And kind of the higher and higher we go with this, we'll probably see a better and better result. So let's do this. Let's also, let's go out of this and just visualize it maybe with something a little bit uh, easier to see here. So let's do, uh, let's do a point velocity. So this can be kind of neat. Uh, we don't need to compute it. We'll keep the incoming, but we'll calculate the speed from this. And then what we could do here is we could visualize that. So we should have speed now in here, right there. And let's visualize that. So we'll visualize the speed. Uh, I'm just going to right click on this, edit this, and I'm going to change this to white water. And hopefully that'll be uh, a little easier to visualize. Oh, actually, yeah, no, that's fine. Let's do that. Oh, and what I'll do is, since this is really low right now, uh, I'm going to do speed and set it to 10. can kind of tweak this a little bit to make sure that it's a little bit more interesting so we'll do something like that then that way we'll have be able to maybe see some more varied noise and movement and things like that actually going to throw a bit more noise in here because it doesn't really seem like it's pushing it as, as much as I would want to. Okay, thank you. So let's do that. Let's just up this to like 15. And now we should start to actually see some real real variation in this. Just for the sake of time, I'm also going to go into this 
and turn it down just a little bit. Just to allow this to sim a little faster. The other thing too that I've noticed with this is that once once you get to the frame where the uh, where you're done emitting, um, it tends to kind of speed up quite a bit. I'm not 100% sure why that's the case here. Um, I'm sure it has to do with the uh, just calculating the new emission or whatever, but I have noticed that. All right, should be right there. There we go. Now we're getting somewhere. And so if I turn this on as well, we'll see that this is going to follow along on this curve. Let's just take a look at what that looks like. So there you go. You're getting kind of an interesting little tube fluid effect there. Um, I'll just let that kind of keep going and maybe we can just do a little flip book of that. Yeah, so I think that's kind of an interesting little result there. Hopefully that um, is uh, makes some sense, and uh, you could see how that would be, you know, useful for for controlling fluids and things like that. You don't have to have it rotating like that. Obviously, you can turn your rotational force off. Um, you don't have to have it, you know, suck in quite the same way. There's all sorts of different things that you could do. You could let it uh, allow it to not all suck back in and let, allow some of the fluid to, to push off and this is something you can certainly do with uh, flip as well um, it can be guided with pop forces and things like that but uh, in this case I think it's a little bit easier to um, kind of deal with some of these forces when um, when it's just basically just straight particles that you're working with so uh, you can create kind of an interesting little look here um, interesting little effect uh, from this so that's the idea of taking, you know, taking a simple um, emission of some particles and guiding that around in your scene. Obviously, you can draw a line that would go anywhere and have whatever type of noise applied to it and things like that. And I have some um, some surface tension on there, which is allowing those droplets and you know to form a bit more. Uh, you could turn that up or down, however you might um, want in your scene. And you can see at the end. They kind of just fly off and do their own thing. So um, that's the idea of doing something like a zero G fluid uh, with some forces that kind of guide it along. So I think you get a pretty neat result from that. Um, so the last thing I wanted to talk about was multiple fluid phases kind of mixing to or you know, mixing and working together. So let's do that and we'll talk about phases a little bit and how those work. So uh, let's see. Uh, multi-phase fluid. Let's do that. So this again will be something pretty straightforward. We'll do a sphere here and just put this center or center it at negative two, two. Then do another sphere and just move this over. Cool. So we've got two spheres. Um, maybe they both could be a little smaller. Maybe we'll do half a meter, something like that. And let's do another vellum fluid, configure fluid. In this case, uh, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to do this at 
two, I think. So let's say initialize. one and this actually you know what I'll, I'll say this because fluid we'll just name it like that so that we can see exactly what we're doing here so this one we're going to do a viscous fluid this one's just going to be more of a standard fluid um, so we're going to be changing the attributes on these a little bit so Let's set this up. So what I want this to do is I want this to sink down. So we want to up the density of it. So let's do something like, I don't know, we'll just do 2000 just to double it. And this will be phase one. We're going to up the viscosity quite a bit. So let's do this. Eh, let's do the viscosity around 2000 as well. We could just add surface tension in there just to give it a value so that they both have a value to work with. Um, all right. So that should be, should do it for that one. So here we're going to do density at a thousand because we want this to kind of be floating on top of it. Uh, but in this case, let's do phases two. The viscosity we can just leave at one and the surface tension, let's do that at like 25. So this is like, a, it's got some surface tension to it. Um, maybe not that high. Maybe we'll do something like 10 for the surface tension. Just give it a little bit of surface tension like a regular fluid. And this is gonna be our viscous fluid. Um, so then what we wanna do is we wanna add some velocities to this. So what we can do is we can just add a point velocity input this and we'll just say keep incoming uh, and add velocity up here let's do I can't remember which direction I had which direction these will be in so let's do this at maybe at like four or something like that give it a little bit okay yep good that's in the right direction because that's going it's trailing away from it. it's going towards the center so that should be good and if we take this over here and wire it in and just say negative four that should be good as well Great. So we have our point velocities. The other thing I'm going to do is just color these so we can see them. Uh, these attributes will stay kind of with our particles. I'm going to turn off this visualizer. So the color for this one for our viscous fluid will be orange, I guess. Let's just do that. And then for our non viscous fluid, we'll do this as like a light blue. So we have an orange and a light blue. I'm going to turn off the velocity vectors. So what we're going to do now is combine these two together, right? Um, because we can't ease. So the reason I'm doing these as two separate things like this is because I can't actually tell this node um, which, uh, which object to work on. So I can't merge these spheres together and have one that makes our viscous fluid and one that makes our standard fluid because there is no... Um, field here to set up groups or things like that to to drive where those points are being created from so what i'm going to do instead is do a pack i'll do a vellum pack so we'll do a vellum pack like this and i'll take these two like so and i mean i could just do this with a regular pack it should work the same but i'm just going to kind of do it the just the cleanest way I can think of because this works in other situations as well where you can use other, you know, you can pack other vellum objects together and merge them this way as well. So let's shift click both of these, alt click to get a merge node. So now we have those merged together and we'll do a vellum unpack here. Great, everything should be back out. And I'm just gonna set down a null and say, Geo and con for the constraints. Great. So there are those two. So let's take a look at what we have um, in our vellum geometry here. So if we look, um, again, pretty pretty straightforward stuff. We've got color here. Uh, we've got our mass set up. Uh, we've got p scale, surface tension. Um, and should have viscosity. So you can see that this is our high viscosity fluid, and this is phase one. This is our, our first fluid phase. Now our second, if we come down here, we'll, I'll find where those split up. Our second phase, surface tension is a little higher and the viscosity is basically off. So in this case, we can see those differences and the difference in mass, where one is two times as massive as the other. 
So that means that that should sink below and the other should float on top. So these are the, the, the attributes that are going to kind of drive our simulation here. We also should have velocity on these, which you can see right here. One is negative four, one is four. So that's all good. Uh, let me actually grab this uh, box setup up here that I made, and I'll just copy and paste this. So we're going to use a similar box just to kind of have these go into. However, I'm going to make it a little bigger. This. See how that looks. Yeah, that should be fine. And let's grab a vellum solver. And what we're actually going to do here is we're not going to wire any of this in. We're just going to wire in our collision mesh, right? Because this is going to set up our collision and it's going to initialize our you know, network that's inside of here. We don't actually need these both to be plugged in because just like before, we'll do a vellum source here. Drop this down, Let's move this out of the way, and we'll grab those two paths. So let's do, uh, that's our zero G. Let's grab our multi-phase fluid, the geo and the constraints just for complete, completeness. Uh, let's also do a pop drag node here so just make sure that we're you know just kind of keeping everything keeping it honest giving a little bit of drag um so that should be good the other thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure that we're sourcing this each sub step right and the other thing that that reminds me of is that we should source these with the seeds so we'll make sure these are both oops dollar sign FF. So these should both be changing each frame. So really this is going to be our main limiting factor for the speed of this, right? Is how quickly that this can get recalculated. So we have our vellum solver here. We should have our two different geometry or our two different streams of, of, uh, fluid and i'm actually going to visualize i'm going to turn off this and just template it i think that'll be a little easier to see and let's just set some of these things up we had before i'm just going to turn the spatial sort on just to make sure that that is efficient and sub steps to five constraints at 20 smoothing at zero and that should be that right now let's see what see where this gets us oh the last thing i need to do is set up um how long this is going to source into here so let's do this at let's do it for a little bit let's do dollar ff less than 60. let's give this a little bit all right let's see what happens here so now these initial velocities are sourcing in here we're going to see that this is going to kind of break apart a bit more um, because it is, you know, obviously is not being, you know, held together with viscosity quite so much. Um, we could up the viscosity a little bit on that. It'll create a little bit of a better stream. Uh, however, I'm just going to leave it as it is right now because I think that'll be fine. So what we'll see is that this yellow one should have some really nice high viscosity and should land and kind of start to pool right there and the blue should flow quite a bit more just like normal fluid um, and it should float on top um, of this uh, orange kind of puddle here that's that's happening it's also not as dense so it can't really push uh, the yellow uh, kind of fluid out of the way so it's going to flow mostly around it uh, and over top of it so this should not really mix at all um, it should stay relatively separate. And these two phases will allow us to kind of make sure that uh, the solver knows what it's working with um, as it's calculating both of these um, two different two different types of fluid. So what I'm actually going to do is just stop this for a second. And I'm going to um, just going to flip book this. Let's grab this. Let it do its thing. I forgot to start a new one. That's all right. I'm just going to hit escape. 
just gonna close that. It's all right. No, nothing lost. Let that kind of. So now we should see that this is going to. We're gonna have our kind of high viscosity on the left there, the low viscosity on the right, and they're gonna really flow and kind of work. You know, they're gonna interact. They're gonna have some some uh, maybe a little bit of mixing, but for the most part, they're gonna stay separate. Uh, you're going to see that the you know the blue is flowing over and around the yellow because we've set that density lower, right? So this is sort of where your your physics come in, right? Your physics uh, knowledge will come in handy, where you know how densities you know interact with different fluids, um, you know what the viscosity is setting, you know how that's going to affect them, um, and surface tension as well. So we're getting, yep, yeah, that should be the end of that emission at 60. And uh, it should kind of settle down, and we should see this uh, kind of all kind of sort itself out. So we'll have this blue fluid that'll be kind of flowing around in there, and the yellow one should stay relative. Like, it'll settle down and kind of create a little puddle there, but um, it should relatively um, just kind of stay put. And so the idea behind this, and um, I would suggest going in and looking at um, the uh, the help for this, because actually there's quite a few um, different setups that it walks through um, in the in the actual help uh, documentation uh, from side effects. And what I would what I would have you look at is. Um, This uh, fluid phase, actually, there's a whole um, setup on this in in the uh, documentation, the vellum documentation. So you can see here we're getting, you know, that separation that we're hoping for. This is very viscous. This is going to kind of flow back and forth and be more just like regular fluid. Um, but hopefully this is giving you an idea for how these things interact and what, you know, the setup would be for these. Um you know, you could have more sources, more different types of fluids going in. Um, you could source them as just individual one shot like fluid. You could have them um, be, um, you know, you could have, you could set a whole bunch of different things up um, and allow it to kind of work together. And this is where the strength of, of these fluids in vellum, I think, really start to show because you can do this stuff and flip and it certainly works, but I think there's quite a bit more setup needed and quite a bit more um, extensive um, kind of knowledge of how the solver works. Whereas in this, you get a pretty decent result pretty quickly on a small scale. Um, and I think it looks pretty neat. So um, certainly something to kind of take a look at and, and see how um, it might work for you uh, in your workflows. And just to um, kind of reiterate that point of, um, you know, how, how you can set these things up. I'm just going to stop that since we've kind of got that going. I'm going to pull up the, uh, the documentation that I was looking through er like earlier. And what you'll see here is that there, this is actually the fluid phases, uh, documentation. And there's a whole bunch of stuff here that will explain to you how to, uh, set up something like this bowl with a blender and all these different things here. Um, it kind of goes through a bunch of different examples. Like there's some really cool stuff in here that that is probably a bit more um, bit more of a walkthrough uh, tutorial than how I wanted to kind of go about this. But you'll see um, there's some really cool stuff on here that shows how these mixing uh, things work with different you know all different phases uh, and might give you a little bit better sense of of um, you know what you might want to do um, and like how you could actually do food simulations with this and all sorts of different weird things that you could do. Um, so it's a really neat um, example on here. So I would definitely take a look at that. I think um, you could be, uh, that could be really, um, really helpful for you. I'll actually drop this in chat just so you guys have this. Um, this is the fluid phases there. So, um, yeah, so question about, so Ruben is asking about how could this be rendered with third-party engines? 
So what I would say for you is uh, the best way that you can go about rendering this, I mean, depending on what, what look you're going for, um, your best bet would be to take this and, um, and probably, um, you would run two different meshes on this, right? So what I would do is do something like uh, two different meshing operations on it, I should say. So what I would do is something like this here. I would take the output, maybe do a split based on the phase. So here I'm just going to take, um, so I should have my phase attribute here, which is right there. So what I'll say is at phase equals one, it's from points. So there's the first phase, and then I'm just gonna do a surface. It's a particle fluid surface is what they recommend for this. Um, so obviously that is not looking good because we need to set our particle separation properly. Uh, so let's do it at, we'll do it a little less than that, 0 0.01, that should be good. So there we go, something like that. And what you're gonna wanna tweak on these, again, is the influence scale droplet size. Uh, I'm just gonna set another one here and let this go to the other one. And then maybe we'll merge those back together just to see them both together, something like that, right? Okay, so we've got our, our fluids and you can tweak these and, and make them work however you want to. With two different fluids, it's gonna be a little trickier, but Let's just, let's just look at one for right now. So if you're wanting to mesh this as an actual fluid, um, I would you know use your particle fluid surface. Um, I'll put a mesh from there, and then um, you can put that into really any third-party renderer. There shouldn't be any issues with it. Um, in fact, you, what I would, I would probably go into Solaris if I want to do lighting and look dev and things like that, bring this into Solaris as, um, you know, using a SOP import. And then, uh, yeah, you, what you're gonna wanna do first though is cache out all your data. You don't wanna be doing that live if you're bringing it into Solaris because um, what Solaris wants to do is take all of your data from all of your frames and combine it all together all at once instead of the kind of frame by frame nature that, um, that we're used to in Houdini, uh, proper, I guess, the standard Houdini. Um, so just something to keep in mind there, but that would certainly be where I would take it and bring it into Solaris and then do my look dev, do my lighting, do all that kind of stuff. And then any third party renderer should be able to work from there, whether it's, you know, Redshift or um, RenderMan or Arnold or V-Ray or whatever. So that would personally be um, the way that I would go about doing that. Um, however, I also would probably use Karma as well because Karma is nice and fast. XPU is getting, you know, has is pretty close to feature complete and is really quick. Um, and the uh, so that's something to take a look at uh, for sure. But yeah, I think it's pretty standard workflow to get it into a third-party render engine. Uh, it's nothing, nothing that would be overly crazy. Um, if you want some more, again, some more documentation on how this particle fluid surface, um, you know, might might work there is um if you look if we look back at this here we look this is the vellum stuff here if you look there is actually a surfacing vellum fluids here that'll give you some more feedback on that as well um you know it's a lot of good information here to help you properly mesh your particles i found that um turning like if you have a lot of droplets turning down the influence scale and up the droplet scale um, actually helped quite a bit. So uh, in this case, that's not the, the scenario because we have really high viscosity fluid. But for example, on this one, I would probably do that where I would turn the influence scale down a little bit and then turn up the droplet scale. Now, again, we've got a lot of tiny little bits here. You might want to tweak your actual simulation before you get this where you want it to be. But nonetheless, there you have it. The other thing you'd want to do too when you're surfacing is is tweak some of your collision objects. So you might actually even want to have um, the other fluid, you know, each fluid know where each other is basic, or one of them know where the other is. Like in this case, um, having this fluid maybe know where your your 
very viscous fluid is that it's not going to probably penetrate um, that might be helpful to kind of clean that up but you know take a look at some of that documentation um, that'll definitely help you uh, quite a bit with figuring out how to surface that better and make that work but um, if we even look at um, for example this simple zero G fluid I'm just gonna jump back into that for a second and just show the particle surfacing on this uh, this should be a pretty easy one to surface because um, we don't have a lot going on here so let's just go a bit further here let's jump to there Another thing uh, to keep in mind, sometimes just having the, uh, like playing it back in the viewport can actually be a little bit slower because there's kind of the viewport redraw time that, that you run into. So if you're feeling like your sims are taking a really long time, but you know more or less that you have them right, uh, you could always just cache them um, and that can help quite a bit um, using the uh, vellum IO in this case, would be probably your best bet, just in case you have other things going on in here that'll cache them all simultaneously. Uh, but anyways, let's look at the surface, particle fluid surface, and just take a look at this real quick. So again, we're gonna do 0 0.02, we'll start there. What I'm gonna do is just template this so I can see where my particles are. And we can see that they're not quite going out to the surface here which is not what we want. So let's just see, just kind of tweak these a little bit and see where we can get. So now with the particle separation like that, it's 0 0.01, uh, it's looking a little bit better. In fact, it might even be a little too much. So what we could do is we could influence scale maybe down a little bit, maybe at two. And then we could up the droplet scale a little bit. And yeah, starting to get some interesting results here. You also are gonna to wanna to filter these a little bit too. Uh, maybe add some smoothing into it. Um, you know, you'll have to kind of play around with these and get get something that's gonna, you know, work for your the look that you're going for, but uh, certainly adding in some filtering can be helpful as well. Um yeah, I'm I can't say that I am a fluid expert <laughs> by any means, uh, but uh, certainly is, you know, a little bit, of, a little bit of fiddling with it here and there to get a to get a good result. But um, I think this certainly will do something a bit more along the lines of what you're uh, what you're looking for there. So um, you can kind of see how this evolves and grows, and it's pretty stable. Actually, is working pretty well. Not getting probably too many pops or weird random things happening here. So there you go so i think that is where we're going to end it uh for the evening hopefully this gives you a better sense of how you can work with vellum fluids um kind of where you know what your starting point is when you're building out these net these setups and uh kind of the attributes to look at uh to know about what's what's going on um within these setups uh, luckily, the fluid setup is actually pretty simple that you don't have all the constraints of some of the other things like cloth and hair and things like that that you have to worry about. Um, it's more just about the point attributes. So I think that's really uh, kind of a benefit in this case where you're not really worrying too much about those um, other pieces in there and stuff. So um, yeah, if you guys have any more questions, please feel free to, to drop them in the chat before um, I sign off and I can kind of touch on them. But um, Next week, uh, I'm going to be planning on, uh, yeah, no problem, Robin. Thank you for uh, joining me. And yeah, no problem, Ruben. Glad to have you guys, all you with us. Um, next week, I'm going to be touching on kind of the last little bit uh, of Vellum, I think. Uh, maybe other than doing a multi-solver uh, type setup. Uh, the last thing I want to touch on is uh, rigids. And uh it's it's a newer thing that's been added to uh, vellum and it certainly is um, it certainly isn't I don't think maybe the most used but I think it's uh, I think it's pretty interesting to be able to use some of the newer rigid um, 
like tools in vellum because sometimes you don't want things to be moving or you know deforming or whatever you want them to stay com- the way that they they were originally um but it you you want that kind of two-way interaction that you can't get through vellum and and rigid you know rbd or whatever and so adding in this rigid workflow is really nice and actually um i believe it was john lynch did a really nice um talk about this at SIGGRAPH last year. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of brush up on those points that he made and try to simplify that into, because his talk is not complex, but it's certainly not bare, bare uh, bones, entry level stuff. So I'm going to try to take that um, and uh, just kind of boil that down in some of its most essential parts. And we can uh, talk through what's going on with rigids and uh, specifically how um, that works in relationship to other solvers. We will definitely in that have some other um, types of vellum, you know, objects in, in our scene, probably some soft bodies and things like that, having the rigids colliding with maybe some fluids as well. Um, so there, that actually might kind of touch on the multi, you know, element, multi-type of vellum solver, you know, objects all in once. Um, we'll see how that goes as I'm kind of, thinking through it um but i think it should be a really interesting one um it's certainly i think the one that's maybe the least used in vellum um and should be hopefully the most insightful as to ways that you could um you know put together your vellum simulation into uh with with other things like rigids and soft bodies and things all together so uh it should be should be an interesting one to see so um yeah i don't see any more um questions in the chat or any comments or anything like that so yeah glad to have everybody with us tonight thank you guys so much for uh joining i see some some thank you and uh in the chat there so um always really glad that you guys are here and and uh commenting that's makes this whole thing a lot more fun for me so uh glad to have you guys along for the ride so uh that'll be it for tonight um and uh, yeah, next week we'll be talking um, about about rigids and uh, looking forward to that and uh, looking forward to actually refreshing myself on the, the uh, little talk that John Lynch did. So I think that'll be um, something I'll be looking forward to in the coming few days or whenever. So again, yeah, thank you guys all for joining and uh, that is where we will end it. And I will see you guys next week. Just keep an eye out on social and stuff like that for... Any updates if there's time changes or anything like that, but otherwise I'll see you guys next week. See ya. Bye.